here we are again. At the beginning of December, as the shadows are lengthening towards solstice, and as several important observances converge, reminding us of the shadows that don't go away, even as we begin lighting candles in this season of light that is now upon us. Monday, December 1st, was World AIDS Day. Today is December 6th, the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. And as Ted shared with us, Thursday, December 10th, is Human Rights Day, as each year Amnesty International holds its global Right for Rights campaign. Meanwhile, we're still here, in the midst of a global pandemic, still here online, doing our best to care for our families, ourselves, and one another during this time of profound uncertainty, while these immense social concerns are still with us. We still observe them, as we do each year, with the accompanying sadness that we still do have to face them, taking up once again our pens, our voices, and our actions to move this world patiently, yet urgently, toward love and justice. The poem I shared with you just now is a challenging one, and all the more so when you learn that its author, Pat Lowther, was herself a victim of domestic violence in 1975. She was reported missing after not showing up for a poetry reading in Vancouver. Her second husband was later convicted of her murder. He died in prison in BC in 1985. When I chose her poem, Random Interview, for this service, I didn't know anything about Pat Lowther. I didn't know what had happened to her. But even without that knowledge, I was deeply moved by her poem that speaks so powerfully to the difficulty of living in this world, which brings us face to face with violence, cruelty, and injustice every single day, if our eyes are open. Her poem resonated with me, especially in the way it weaves together the life experiences of fear, of fatigue, and finally, the longing for blessing, the longing for love and for peace. In that final stanza, what I want to be, what I, what I want is to be aware of the spaces between stars, to breathe continuously the sources of sky, a veined sail moving, my love never setting foot to the dark anvil of earth. In those lines, she articulates the hope that someday we may be free of the evil and injustice that weighs us down. 35 years after Pat Lowther's death, and more than 30 years now after 14 women were killed at Polytechnique Montréal because they were women, gender-based violence is still very much with us. In Canada and around the world, calls to assaulted women's helplines has increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is happening as families are, of course, facing intensified stress, financial crises, and there are suddenly no safe places to go. People are held together in ways that they cannot escape at this time. The United Nations has created a powerful campaign to spread public awareness about what it calls the shadow pandemic, encouraging all of us to check in frequently with each other to make sure we are safe and well. It's also essential for all of us of all genders to care for our mental health during this time of high anxiety and to reach out to professional supports if we or others are at risk. We try to say it frequently, but it's worth repeating that the ministers and pastoral care team at First Unitarian are here to, to provide support when needed. The focus on human rights in today's service may feel challenging right now. Violence against women and girls is a painful subject, and the stories of human rights abuses brought to light by Amnesty International are difficult to think about. Remembering, too, that this past Tuesday was World AIDS Day, which also marked the beginning of Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week in Canada. We note that the coronavirus pandemic can threaten access to healthcare, including HIV treatment for people around the world. 
and that global health concerns and justice issues are deeply and continually intertwined, making them all the more challenging and urgent to address. It can seem at times that these challenges are just too much to take in. And yet, we also know that the small actions within our scope can make a very important difference. Educating ourselves, for one, connecting with organizations on the front lines of human rights and public health, such as Amnesty International, writing a simple letter, along with thousands of other people worldwide in support of those wrongfully imprisoned, or making a financial donation to a shelter or a helpline today, phoning a friend, offering a listening ear, providing a bridge to professional supports. These are very simple things, simple things that each of us can do, and they are deeply important during this crucial time. They serve to counter the dark anvil of forces that weigh upon us, and they remind us of our capacity to contribute in positive ways to the world, even if we ourselves are feeling tired, stressed, or weighed down right now. It is tiring to be still here in the midst of what's been called the full catastrophe, a world shadowed by fear, inequality, aggression, and violence. We grapple with the fact that it is so hard to find peace in such a world, despite our sincere efforts in social justice and spiritual growth. Despite our good intentions in building relationships and extending love and care to others. As the poet and teacher Mark Nepo writes, most of us are educated to think that if we work hard enough, are good enough and disciplined enough, we'll crack the secret of life and live at the end of all trouble. While those traits are helpful tools, he says, being human doesn't work that way. One of the greatest challenges of personal growth is to come to terms with this very difficult reality. No matter how kind we hope and try to be, how ethical, how awakened or conscious we hope to become, any words you might like to use, we may, we will continue to encounter what is painful, unfair, and unjust. Inevitably, too, we will cause pain to others, and that, too, is difficult to bear. Sometimes in our striving to become better people and stronger communities, we may imagine that our sincere efforts will lead naturally to a more loving and just experience of life. We Unitarian Universalists may be especially prone to this notion as we have so carefully formulated a set of principles designed to create kind and inclusive justice-seeking communities. And as we draw on such a wide range of wisdom sources that guide us so surely toward love. Probably each of us here has hoped or believed at times that by learning enough or growing enough, reflecting enough, being vulnerable enough or caring enough that we might somehow find freedom from the most painful experiences of life. In discovering that that is not possible, perhaps through a painful loss or rejection, through failure, trauma, or tragedy, or simply witnessing the trauma of the world, we risk becoming cynical and disillusioned. Probably many of us have experienced that, too. But I believe that the deeper promise of life that runs like an underground river beneath all our experience is that, is that life learns from the, from the bending and the breaking, that life seeks to heal, repair, and renew, that in the dark of winter there is a deep peace that holds and heals. Every once in a while, I come across a piece of writing that expresses what I'd like to say to you better than I ever could. So I'd like to share with you this longer excerpt from the book I quoted earlier, Mark Nepo's The Endless Practice. I was already working on this service with its title still here when I stumbled on this passage. Each of us must make our peace with suffering and especially unnecessary suffering 
which doesn't mean our resignation to a violent world. For the fully engaged heart is the antibody for the infection of violence. As our heart breaks with compassion, it strengthens itself and all of humanity. Can I prove this? No. Am I certain of it? Yes. We are still here. Immediately, someone says, barely. But we are still here. More alive than dead. More vulnerable than callous. More kind than cruel. Though we each carry the lot of it. He goes on. That we go numb along the way is to be expected. Even the bravest among us who give their lives to care for others go numb with fatigue when the heart can take in no more, when we need time to digest all we need. Overloaded and overwhelmed, we start to pull back from the world so we can internalize what the world keeps giving us. Perhaps the noblest private act is the unheralded effort to return, to open our hearts once they've closed, to open our souls once they've shied away, to soften our minds once they've been hardened by the storms of the day. Always on the inside of our hardness and shyness and numbness is the face of compassion through which we can reclaim our humanity. Mark Nepo. Perhaps the noblest private act is the unheralded effort to return how many times have each of us found some way to return, to take a breath, to return to the table, to extend a small kindness, to meditate or pray, to phone a friend, to sing a song, to sit with a painful truth, or to say a quiet thank you for the simple fact of being still here? in the moment-by-moment -moment choice to do what we can with the one life that we have, we are full participants in the, in the ongoing creative process of life. The creative process that does not deny and can never eliminate suffering, but that upholds love and healing and continually reaches for it, especially at the darkest of times. As we are still here, sharing this life of complicated and continuing concern, may we open ourselves to the peace that is offered to us in the heart of each moment, that we may become the instruments of love and peace and justice that this world so surely needs, as it always has and as it always will.